You're listening to the Knowledge Archives podcast. Welcome to the Knowledge Archives podcast. We're a group of students on a mission to learn from as many different disciplines of knowledge as possible. I'm your host, Madhav Malhotra, and today I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Theodore Yanaros, a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute for Environmental Research and Sustainable Development at the National Observatory of Athens in Greece. His work focuses on weather and climate modeling, studying factors like extreme weather and the effects of urban environments on climate. I'm very excited to learn more about how this essential research works and affects our daily lives today. So thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking the time and I'm very much looking forward to learning more about this very essential topic, especially in today's times where the importance of climate science And first of all, I'd love to just ask you to quickly introduce yourself, what you're working on, and how you got started with this area of work. Thank you, Madhav. My name is uh, Theodor Yanaros. I am a physicist and uh, meteorologist. I am currently working as an associate researcher at the National Observatory of Athens in Greece. My field of uh, expertise lies in the realm of uh, what we call atmospheric modeling or numerical modeling. So practically for my colleagues, I'm a modeler. I am a researcher who uses uh, mathematical models, computer models, to simulate all aspects of uh, the atmospheric environment, including weather and climate and all the phenomena that take place in the atmosphere that surrounds our planet. Mm-hmm. I think it's very amazing to hear about this kind of science and it'll be really great to talk about the specifics involved here. But just before that, I'd love to just quickly talk about some of the foundations of this kind of work and outline some of the assumptions I have going into this discussion. So I'll just give a series of statements and ask you at the end if they're accurate or if there's anything else you'd like to add when it comes to my understanding of this science. Is that fine? Yes, yes, yes. All right. Starting off, when it comes to predicting weather and climate, I think what people really need to realize is just how important this science is and has been for all of human history. Especially now, it's, you know, it's really important to think about the effects of human-induced climate change and talk about the importance of weather and climate modeling in that context, but we've actually been doing this for thousands of years, like going back to the ancient cultures and civilizations like the Babylonians, who might just have very simplistic ways of predicting the climate or weather conditions, such as looking at clouds or looking at the changes of seasons and the movements of animals that they might hunt, etc., etc. So... This is a hugely important field and it has been for thousands of years. And I think one of the biggest ideas to outline here is especially when it comes to weather and climate modeling and the computational models you work with, some of the things that are very important to understand are just the foundations of why is weather different from climate and think about in a modeling context, what is so different about it? So When we think about weather, it is the conditions like rain, like sunshine, like local specific events that happen in the short run versus climate, which is the average of these events happening in the long run. But when it comes to predicting these, I think it's really cool to just think about the surface level understanding that I had, which was that the ways that we try to predict these different phenomena are actually very different in the data that we use. So with weather, we use data about initial conditions, like the precipitation right now, like the air pressure right now, etc., etc., and then try to use physics models to forecast how all of these initial conditions interact with each other and how that can move forward. And this is really hard because weather is a very chaotic system. So when you have even the smallest of changes, it really creates a lot of change in the entire system as a whole. So it's really hard to predict whether, say, beyond two weeks and do that very accurately. On the other hand, when we look at climate models, 
there you might be looking at things like boundary conditions, which are other types of variables like the amount of solar radiation that an area is receiving over time. And based on this, you can see that these kinds of conditions don't fluctuate a lot over time. And then because of that, it's easier, relatively speaking, to kind of model how, how these conditions change climate patterns over a long run. But the issue is that even with small changes in climate, you can have extreme changes in weather. So all of these models are based on different kinds of data and they can be used for different purposes with different, say, regions with different accuracies and different time periods in mind. Is that correct? Yes, yes, you've pretty much covered it all. You gave a pretty much good overview of how weather and climate lie one to each other. If I had to add something, I would say that weather and climate are actually two different aspects of the same thing. You see, weather is, as you said, the actual conditions uh, we experience at a certain moment, at a certain place on our planet. For example, at my place in Athens, it's currently sunny and it's hot, so this is the current weather. And if we would like to simply describe what climate is, is climate, we could say that it is uh, the average weather. If we take uh, on the same day the weather conditions that uh, happen, this, is, this will give us the climate of uh, the area. And this differentiation between weather and climate also, also has an effect on how we model either weather or climate. For instance, on weather, as you correctly noted, weather prediction is actually a problem of initial conditions. We need to know what the weather is now in order to be able to predict what the weather will be tomorrow. And we rely heavily on the quality and the abundance of such uh, initial conditions which are based on dense observational networks, on satellite observations, on very varying array of observational platforms. On the other hand, for climate, we rely mostly on boundary conditions, that is, uh, on uh, conditions that vary on uh, larger time scales, such as uh, solar radiation or other phenomena that uh, take place on larger time scales, like the El Nino oscillation or the North Atlantic oscillation. And this is how very briefly and very simply put weather and climate modeling work. Mm -hmm. And when considering the importance of this field, I know I mentioned earlier that we have been relying on these kinds of weather predictions for mm -hmm. agriculture and hunting in the past. But now, when it comes to your work on this field, day-to-day -day things that you're working on in terms of the types of models that you're in charge of, in terms of the colleagues mm -hmm. that you're working with, who mm -hmm. is this kind of research beneficial? And could you give some of the details about what kind of stakeholders might take your work and then apply it to something else? Okay, so first of all, I believe that we would all agree that our own existence of humans is very closely tied to the atmosphere. This is because from the very first moment we come to this world, we need the atmosphere to survive and the atmosphere allows life to thrive on our planet. So our own existence depends on the atmosphere and what happens in the atmosphere that is the weather and climate. And starting with the very simple things like, for example, what am I going to wear tomorrow when I go out of my home? I'm going to look at the weather forecast and see if it's going to be uh, hot and sunny or if it's going to be cold and rainy. So from decisions very simple like this to uh, decisions that have to do with uh, civil protection. For example, uh, we are building and we are needing now more than ever in the frame of the climate change. We need early warning systems. What is what we call an early warning system is a system that it is able to provide accurate and timely predictions of an impending severe weather phenomenon like, for example, a flash flood or a severe thunderstorm or a major snowfall. And apart from civil protection, as uh, we are looking at this in the light of climate change, we also have renewable energy resources because uh, knowing uh, if we know how to predict uh, weather and climate conditions, we know, to, we know how to forecast what is the expected production of energy from wind or from solar. So this is another sector where 
weather prediction and uh, climate modeling may provide helpful insights. And also, as I mentioned there, we have civil protection and in particular wildfires. In a field that I have been working more specifically recently, where we have now the ability to predict how a wildfire will spread if it ignites at a place. And this is also very important. Mm -hmm. And when we get into all of these incredible applications in your day to day, you're working with models that focus on Europe and Greece in particular. How much mm -hmm. data are you working with? Where does this data come from? Like, are we talking terabytes, petabytes, etc.? And then what kind of computational power is required to analyze this kind of data? You are very correct, actually, to most of people. Weather prediction currently seems like something very simple to tell what the weather will be tomorrow. But in fact, in order to get uh, this picture of what the weather will be tomorrow, we need actually huge amounts of data. And this data currently come from global meteorological centers like the National Center for Environmental Predictions in the US or the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. These uh, centers have currently the computational ability in order to collect, process, and produce the initial conditions. So the initial conditions are actually a set of uh, very diverse observations from either weather balloons, from aircrafts, from ships, from satellites, that all together, when combined, build the what we call today's weather, the initial conditions from a model. These conditions then come to our infrastructure at the regional research center, like the National Observatory of Athens, and then we have to apply what we call a regional a numerical model a model that focuses particularly on a specific geographic region. And this is how we are able to go down with respect to the spatial resolution and have the ability to predict weather at very fine spatial resolutions down to the meter scale. Actually, as an example, at the National Journal of Athens, with the models we currently operate on a daily basis to provide weather forecasts and some climate uh, predictions, we are talking about some uh, tenths of terabytes every month. It's a lot of data going in and out of the models. And actually the challenge in our era is to try and take full advantage of all of this data and all, and all of all of this information flow. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what is possible now? in terms of meteorological modeling because of these advances in hardware and software that, say, wasn't possible 10 years ago? Well, in meteorology, there has been a, what is called a quiet revolution over the past few decades. And actually, this whole revolution was very closely tied to the revolution in computational power, building new computers, faster computers, building new observational platforms, uh, coming up with new instruments that would, we could put on satellites and uh, orbit around the Earth. So as uh, technology and especially artificial intelligence or machine learning or deep learning is advancing, it is expected that this will have also an effect on meteorology. For instance, it, it has been a common practice for a decade at least to use artificial intelligence methods and techniques in order to improve our weather forecast. As a very simple example, if you have a daily forecast that your model produces, your model is simply an analog of the atmosphere, so it has errors, it has flows. And if you have an observing station at a certain location, at your hometown, for example, you use the observation of this station in order to correct uh, the forecast you provide. And you could do this either with what we call data simulation techniques or either with what we call model output statistics. And the model output statistics, or MORS, as it is called in short, is a technique that is, in essence, based on artificial intelligence. You teach this numerical model how to predict weather given your model forecast and past observations. So as we get more from artificial intelligence, I expect that we would be far more able to predict the weather even more accurately. Besides this, we have now access to 
enormous computing power. The global centers, like I said, for ECMWF have access to computing power that was unforeseen a couple of years ago, maybe. And we are now able, just to give you an idea, the ECMWF is now able to predict weather conditions around the entire globe at a spatial resolution of about nine kilometers. That means that you have a grid where each point is placed every nine kilometers. And this is truly enormous. If we go back some years ago, some decades ago, we were only able to forecast weather at a global scale with a resolution that was around the order of 100 kilometers. And now we have gone down, even down from 10 kilometers. And this is expected to advance even more in the future and we'll get more computing power. And uh, computing power, besides uh, the issue of having more fine resolutions, more detailed forecasts, the other issue with computing power is that we, we, we will be able to provide more timely information, more timely forecasts. Because the one important thing is to be able to provide forecasts that are as accurate as possible. And the other thing is to be able to provide forecasts at the right time before an event happens. Mm -hmm. And then moving from this overview of all of these advancements that are just incredible when it comes to our ability to forecast weather like this, I wanted to also dive into some of your specific mm -hmm. areas of research because I found it very interesting, all of the different themes that you're working with. One that is just immediate when it comes to the effects of climate change is I saw all of your work about how we can predict extreme weather events such as droughts, wildfires, etc. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask when it comes to our ability to model these events, there has been a vast amount of change in the incidence or severity of these extreme weather events in, say, the past few decades. And then when we were actually training these models to be able to predict these extreme weather events, and we think that we had these hypotheses about the majority of this being caused by human activity, that we need to adjust these models to account for human activity or were they actually mm -hmm. able to predict these kinds of changes ahead of time? Mm -hmm. First of all, as I always like to say, maybe 10 years ago, we were talking about climate change as if it was something that will come and will happen and what uh, its consequences uh, could be. So today, climate change is happening and we get all these phenomena you mentioned, like uh, droughts, like wildfires. We have seen wildfires in Siberia, well above the Arctic cycle. And this, is, this may have an, ampli an amplification effect on climate change because Siberia and the areas above the Arctic cycle are a huge carbon stock. We get other extreme phenomena like torrential rains. We get more hurricanes, more intense hurricanes. And all these severe phenomena, weather phenomena, severe weather is, is happening today, it's happening now. With respect to weather models, to numerical weather prediction models, there is no need to do any adjustments in order to, to predict uh, these uh, phenomena. What I mean is that we do not need to insert into the models any information about the footprint of anthropogenic activity and how this activity influences the condition of the atmosphere. And the reason for this is that in a weather model, this human footprint is already included in the initial conditions that are used for driving a weather model. But for climate models, these models have been upgraded compared to their previous versions and they are continuously improved in order to better include all aspects of human activity that influence how climate changes in response in response to the human influence. And we see that the models, the new generation of climate models we have are able, are very able to successfully predict and simulate how climate is going to change in the next few decades. And this is also affected by the amount of data we have, the amount of computing power, because in order to run a climate simulation, you need to run it for several decades and maybe hundreds of years. So you need computing power. So all this uh, revolution we had in computing power and our better understanding of how climate 
works has allowed us to improve the representation of our climate processes and climate models. And we can now be very certain that what our climate models tell us, the story they tell us, we can be pretty much certain that it is something that it is going to happen if we humans do not take any measures to counteract the ongoing climate change. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very, very crucial message and one that we so often hear, but it unfortunately has not always had the effect we want, this kind of message. So mm -hmm. very important to share that. And I also know that your research focuses on some interactions between human activity and climate that we don't hear as much about. And I would love to ask you about that. In mm -hmm. particular, I saw your work in focusing on changes in regional climate with respect to urban environments with the effect of having heat sinks in urban environments due to the construction that we've done, due to the changes we've closed to different regions. Mm -hmm. When it comes to this effect, one, mm -hmm. what is mm -hmm. the predominant source of urban environments having mm -hmm. a heat sink? And then two, mm -hmm. when it comes to the effect of this, what are mm -hmm. the problems that this is causing for just as humans, but then also to the mm -hmm. wildlife around, say, cities, metropolitan areas, mm -hmm. etc. You see, what, what happens if we look at the urban environment, we can actually see an anthropogenic manifestation of, of meteorological conditions change. It is uh, what we call the urban heat island effect. It is a very well-known phenomenon, at least to us researchers. Very simply put, it's a common experience to people that live in uh, large metropolitan areas like Athens or in Montreal, where you have the city center being uh, significantly warmer than its surroundings. And by significant, significantly warmer, this temperature difference can reach up to 6 or, ten, or even 10 degrees Celsius under specific meteorological conditions. And this is actually a, a micrography of what happens on a global scale with our climate system. You see in a city, where you have a city, you have replaced all natural surfaces with artificial surfaces like roads, pavements, and the buildings. And this has a huge influence on what we call the energy budget of the area. That is how much energy this area manages to receive and absorb and how much energy this particular area manages to emit back and therefore cool. So the urban heat island is a very important phenomenon. It was actually the subject of my PhD. It is a phenomenon that has major implications for quality of life of urban communities. For instance, the higher temperatures create thermal stress for people that live in dense urban areas. The higher temperatures in the city, in the center of cities, also affect air pollution. So you have also problems associated with the health of the residents. And it has been also reported that this phenomenon can even create its own weather. It's because you have the city center that it's warmer than its surroundings. And you have this warmer coming up from the city center rising up and this may generate a circulation that may produce rain far away from the city center. As I said earlier, it's actually, to my view, it's like a micrography of what happens on a global scale with the emission of greenhouse gases and how our climate gets warmer. But it is important to also note, now that we talk about urban areas, that because this is something that many climate change denials are stating, they state that because we have the urban heat island effect and that we have meteorological stations that we're measuring inside cities, that the temperature rise we see is uh, due to the urban heat island effect. This is actually a myth because all the measurements we have and on which we base our estimates about how the global temperature of our planet has changed, take into account this effect, the urban heat island effect, so that we can be sure that the temperature rise we see on a global scale is not affected by temperature rises on a regional level attributed to phenomena like the urban heat island effect. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important to note that and talk about mm -hmm. some of 
these specific details that people might be uncertain about. But then also, mm -hmm. to me, it's just astonishing to hear the huge amounts by which we can influence our climates, just as one species, given all of our collective impact, sometimes it's hard to realize what is the effect that we might have. But it's just so, so incredible to me to notice that we can have such a large effect that we quite literally can make our own weather. And this kind of long-term future thinking, it brings mm -hmm. me to my last line of questions for you, which are, one thing that I'm wondering about is, given how important it is to note weather data and climate data and all of these important applications it can have, do you think that there is enough interdisciplinary work going into this when it comes to the people that might be able to access this data for other purposes? For instance, like, say, a biologist who wants to study how wildlife might be different mm -hmm. in urban areas and consider the effect mm -hmm. of different uh, climates based on that or any other type of scientist that might study a specialized mm -hmm. application that could really use mm -hmm. this kind of data. Do you think there are mm -hmm. enough people from other disciplines coming into work on this area and are there any barriers preventing that? Mm -hmm. That's a very, very interesting question and it's actually I would say the future, the future evolution of meteorology. Meteorology and climatology are becoming more and more an, an interdisciplinary science. As we discussed earlier, one of the key challenges of this era is how we take advantage of the full wealth of data we have. And this is where people from computer science come in and provide their insights on how we can manipulate this data, how, well, how can we extract useful information from this data. And this is of uh, paramount importance for a wide array of applications, as you mentioned, in agriculture or, in, or even in biology. And all these need people from different backgrounds and different fields of expertise to collaborate and provide new applications. And this brings us to the, the next challenge, which is to, to build applications that are really meaningful to the people, to the society, to stakeholders. Applications that are simple to use, that are easy to communicate information, because one thing is to have the proper information, like, for example, a forecast for a coming thunderstorm, but it is another thing on how to communicate this information to the public in order to avoid unwanted effects like people coming out in a chaotic way. So this, all these challenges need people, not only meteorologists, not only physicists, but we also need computer scientists because also all numerical models are actually thousands lines of code. So people from the computer science can work on improving, not even on working on what we call the big data analysis, but also on improving computing efficiency to predict weather and climate. We also need, for example, sociologists to determine ways of effectively communicating our warnings and how people will get a better understanding of how weather, what is expected and what their actions should be when expecting a certain weather phenomena. And we also need better, all this, to me, come with, within the scope of a better educational system where our children, where young people, will be better aware of what is climate change, how people, we people, even with our daily actions, affect weather, affect weather climate, so that we would be very much climate aware. And actually, this is our direction on a global scale. We are now moving from climate, uh, what we called climate mitigation, that was once how we could uh, mitigate the impacts of climate change. We are now moving towards climate adaptation, how we would be able to adapt to the new conditions that will take place uh, on our planet. So all these aspects that uh, include weather and climate require very diverse expertise, not only meteorologists, but also people working on other fields of science. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very great forward-leaning note to wrap up on. And if someone was interested to learn more about your research or just research about the topic of what is real in terms of climate, in terms of meteorology and how it works, where might they go? Actually, they should be they might go all over the internet 
you could find information about weather. They should be very careful on what they read about climate change and weather. There's a good website where, which includes uh, information about climate change and actual information based on science. And I think it's called skepticalscience.com. It's a very good starting point for those that are interested on climate change and how it works. And they may even found research work freely available on weather and climate. And besides that, there are very many, many, many very good universities all over the world. If anyone is interested to study meteorology, to go and learn more and follow this field. Personally, I'm fascinated by meteorology and I would advise anyone who is interested to just follow it. It's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great call to action to wrap up on. So thank you again for taking the time to explain all of these fascinating insights in the field of meteorology, but also to think about the importance this has for a larger society and culture together. Mm -hmm and then think about how all of this will come together and the different interactions there in the future. I thank you for your invitation, Matt, and I believe it's very important, especially in these years, to try and promote real science and facts that are based on science. Thank you. <laughs>